Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Learn With Me. I'm Deborah Hansen. Today, we're going to be looking at AP Psychology 4.7 Part 2, which is the second CED question. Before we get started, thank you to everybody who's already subscribed to the channel. And Kevin, if, if you haven't done that already, please, if you could hit that subscribe button, that like button and put comments. I'm not sure how this all works, but they keep telling me that I have to I have to say like, subscribe and comment. So please, if you can do that. Uh, well, Clifford and I really appreciate it. So on this slide, you're going to see the key terms for 4.7. This is for the entire 4.7, not just uh, the second CED question. And as always, I always do a separate video with just the key terms, examples, and definition for each of the key terms that you're going to need to know. Remember that key to the five is knowing those key terms and being able to apply them on test day. Okay, so the second CED question is explain how social norms and experiences influence the expression of emotions. So we're going to go into all the essential knowledge that you need to be able to answer this question for exam day. We'll start off with an introduction to emotional expression, which is basically emotional expression is shaped by cultural norms, individual experiences, and situational context. Now let's dive into that. So we're going to start off by talking about something really fascinating, universal emotions. Did you know that there are certain emotions that we all share, no matter where we're from in the world? These emotions include anger, disgust, sadness, happiness, surprise, and fear. And what's amazing is that people across different cultures recognize these emotions in the same way, mostly through facial expressions. So this idea comes from research psychologist Paul Ekman. He traveled to remote areas and showed people People pictures of faces expressing different emotions. And what he found was incredible. People, even in cultures that had no contact with the outside world, could accurately identify emotions like happiness from a smile or anger from a scowl. This suggests that these emotions aren't something we learn, but something we're born with. So let's think about an example. Imagine you're traveling to a country where you don't speak the language. And even if you don't understand the words, you probably recognize a smile as a sign of happiness or a frown as a sign of sadness, right? That's because these facial expressions are universal. They transcend language and culture. And so why does this matter? Understanding universal emotions helps us connect with people no matter where they're from. It's also useful useful in areas like cross-cultural communication, psychology, and even artificial intelligence. And it reminds us that at our core, we're all human and experience emotions in similar ways. Can you think of a time when you're un you understood someone's feelings just by their facial expressions or a moment when your emotions were so clear they didn't need any words? So we've been talking a lot about emotions like happiness and fear and how they're considered universal. But now let's take it one step further. Did you know that there's some debate about just how universal emotions really are? Let's explore what we mean when we say mixed results in universality. So here's the key insight. While a lot of research, like Paul Ekman's studies, support the idea that certain emotions are universal, other studies suggest that there are important cultural differences in how emotions are expressed and even interpreted. So for example, let's think about happiness. A smile is almost always recognized as a sign of happiness, but the way that smile is expressed can vary. In some cultures, people might show big, wide smiles with lots of energy, and in others, smiles might be more subtle or restrained. The same goes for other emotions. How we show anger, sadness, or even surprise can depend on our cultural norms and expectations. So why does this matter? Well, it helps us understand that emotions are both biological and shaped by culture when we grow up. So this is important for things like cross-cultural communication and even global psychology research. What feels normal in one culture might look very different in another. So while emotions might be universal in their basic form, the way we express and understand them has cultural layers. So what do you think? Can you think of an example where someone's way of showing an emotion seemed different and surprising to you? Let's have a look now at display rules, which are the social norms or cultural rules that tell us how, when, and where it's appropriate to show our emotions. And these rules are something we learn from the society and culture that we grow up in, and they can vary across the world. So for example, in some cultures, people are taught to suppress certain emotions in public. So for example, in Japan, which is a collectivist culture. In these cultures, maintaining group harmony is really important. So emotions like anger might be suppressed or hidden in public to avoid disrupting relationships. You might not see someone yelling in frustration or visibly showing their anger, even when they can feel it inside. So now let's compare that to individualist cultures like the United States, where expressing emotions, including anger, is often seen as a way to assert individuality and stand up for oneself. It's more socially acceptable to express your feelings openly, even if those feelings are negative, like frustration or anger. 
So the same emotion like anger can look very different depending on the cultural display rules. These differences can even affect how we interpret emotions in others. If someone from a culture that su suppresses emotions look calm, they might still be feeling upset, but you wouldn't know it. And on the flip side, in cultures where emotions are openly expressed, you might be able to immediately see how someone feels. So understanding these display rules is super important for things like cross-cultural communication. It helps us avoid misinterpreting someone's emotions based on our own cultural norms. So what do you think? Can you think of a time when someone's way of expressing or not expressing an emotion surprised you? So what triggers our emotions? Well, it's something called elicitors of emotion. These are the events or situations that spark an emotional response from us. For example, think about winning a competition. For most of us, that would elicit joy, right? But here's the interesting part. How we express that joy can vary a lot depending on our cultural norms. In some cultures, people might show their joy by cheering loudly, jumping up and down, or hugging everyone around them. This is common in cultures that encourage open, expressive behavior, like many individualist cultures. But in other cultures, like collectivist ones, People might still feel joy, but they might express it in a more subtle way, like smiling modestly or quietly acknowledging their success, so they don't stand out too much. So while the event, the elicitor, is the same, the way we respond emotionally can be shaped by the culture we live in. So why is this important? Understanding how elicitors of emotion work and recognizing these cultural variations can help us better connect with and understand people from different backgrounds. It's also a reminder that while we all experience emotions, the way we show them can look very different depending on where we're from. So now that we're talking about emotions, it's also important to look at how gender influences emotional expression. So this is a fascinating topic because gender norms, those unwritten rules about how men and women are supposed to act. So that plays a big role in shaping not only how emotions are expressed, but also how they're interpreted by others. So here's the key point. Gender norms within cultures influence what emotions people feel comfortable showing. So for example, in many cultures, women are encouraged to express emotions like sadness, empathy, or compassion. You might see this in how women are often expected to be nurturing or emotionally supportive. So on the other hand, men are often taught to suppress emotions that might be seem vulnerable, like sadness or fear. And instead, they may feel more pressure to express emotions like anger or confidence, which are often seen as stronger, more masculine emotions. So now what's the impact of these norms? For, well, for one, they can shape how people perceive emotional strength or sensitivity. For example, women who openly express sadness might be seen as more empathetic, but they might also face unfair stereotypes, like being labeled as too emotional. Emotional. Meanwhile, men who suppress vulnerability might be seen as strong, but they could struggle with expressing their feelings in healthy ways. So it's important to understand that these norms are socially constructed, meaning they're created by society, not something people are born with. And while they vary across cultures, the idea of gender influencing emotion is pretty universal. So we just talked about how gender influences emotion. Now let's talk about how age affects the way we express our emotions. Because as we grow up, our emotional experience expression changes, not just because we mature, but because of social expectations about how we should act at different stages of our life. So let's start with children. Kids tend to express their emotions more openly and without much regulation. For example, if a child is feeling frustrated, they might cry or throw a temper tantrum right in the middle of the grocery store. Been there. Okay. Or if they're happy, they might jump up and down or laugh uncontrollably. They don't hold back because they haven't learned how to do that yet or why to regulating their emotions in social situations is important. Now let's look at adults. As we grow older, society ex expects us to regulate our emotions more. And for instance, if an adult feels upset, they might try to hold back their tears in public or take a moment to calm down before responding. This regulation often comes from a desire to appear composed or to meet cultural norms about emotional behavior. Here's an example. Imagine a child and an adult experiencing sadness. A child will cry openly, no matter where they are. But an adult might hold back their tears in public and wait until they're private in a private area to express that sadness. It's a clear example of how age and maturity influence emotional expression. So why does this matter? 
Understanding how age affects emotional expression helps us to see how people's responses are shaped, not just by how they feel, but also by what society expects of them. So it's also a reminder to have empathy for people of all ages, whether it's a child who's upset in public or an adult who's holding back their feelings. So we've looked at gender and age and how that influences emotional expression, but we also have to look at how socioeconomic class influences emotional expression. So this is a fascinating area because our access to resources and the kinds of experiences we have can shape not only what we feel, but also how we express these emotions. Here's a key point. Socioeconomic status can impact emotional expression in different ways. For example, people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds may rely more heavily on communal support systems, such as family, friends, and neighbors, you know, for help during tough times. Because of this reliance, they might express emotions like gratitude more openly and frequently to maintain those social bonds. So gratitude becomes a key way to strengthen connections within their community. Now, on the other hand, people from higher socioeconomic backgrounds may have greater access to individual resources, such as wealth or education, which can make them feel more independent. This independence can sometimes mean emotions like gratitude or reliance on others are expressed less openly, as they may need less communal support. So let's think of an example. Imagine someone from a lower socioeconomic background receives help from their community, like a neighbor fixing their car or friends providing childcare. They might openly express gratitude, saying thank you multiple times or giving back in some way, like cooking a meal for that person. Contrast this to someone from a higher socioeconomic background who can afford to pay these services. They might feel thankful, but express it less visibly because the relationship is more transactional. So understanding this connection between class and emotions is important because it helps us recognize how people's experiences shape their emotional world. It's also a, rem a reminder to approach these differences with empathy and awareness. So let's review everything we just learned about. Universal emotions, anger, disgust, sadness, happiness, surprise, and fear are often recognized globally though expressions may vary. We talked about cultural norms, display rules, and elicitors shape how emotions are expressed across different cultures. And lastly, individual factors, gender, age, and socioeconomic status further influence emotional expression within cultural contexts. And that is all the essential knowledge you need to know for 4.7 Emotions Part 2, which is the second CED question, which was explain how social norms and experiences influence the expressions of emotions. Hopefully you found that helpful. If you did, hit that like and subscribe button for me. Helps me a lot. And leave me a comment too. Apparently that also helps. I'm still learning this whole YouTube thing, but thank you so much for everybody who's been supporting me by hitting the subscribe button and the like button and leaving comments. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time.